Okay. I just want to, before the PowerPoint goes up, I just want to ask you a question. Based upon the songs that we've sung this morning, can anyone guess what I'm going to talk about? Peace, Peace? yeah. Anything else? Anything? Angels. And the angels appeared to who? The shepherds, okay, there we go. So if you've got a Bible, Luke chapter 2, it'd be really good if you could uh, have your Bibles with you. And we are going to uh, explore a little bit about this story. Now, this is a very familiar story, isn't it? The words of this story are probably some of the most well-known. They're read every Christmas. And for many of us, we can remember nativity plays, perhaps. Maybe you starred as a shepherd in one of the nativity plays. Or maybe your children or your grandchildren have had a starring role as the 25th shepherd or something in the school play. We, we kind of know this stuff, don't we? And as I go through some of these words with you, you'll probably be able to recite them in your head. You've known them so well. But what I want to do this morning is I want to explore this passage, and you're, you're kind of used to me now over these years, and you know that I kind of want to bring um, just an interesting perspective And what I try to do all the time when I look at the Bible, whether I'm preaching it, whether I'm just doing my own study, is I try and see what would a first century person living at that time in Jesus' day, what would they have heard when they heard the story? Because we can read it and we read it and we've got our own understanding, haven't we? Yeah, because we we, we don't live in the first century, do we? We live in the 21st century. So we're 2,000 years removed and we live in a completely different culture and context. We live in a Western, modern context, don't we? So when we read the story, what we've got to do is put ourselves back into, if we can, what would they have heard? And I've said to you before, it's like when you go to the, the optician. And that, you know, lens one or lens two, do you remember that? Yes? And lens one, and you're sat there and you can, make out the, you can make out the letters, but they're a bit blurry. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah? And then the switch, lens two, suddenly, everything becomes clear. And it's like that. We, we kind of read the Bible and we can see some of the letters but they're a bit blurry in our 21st century mindset. But when we try and go back to what they may have heard, suddenly it all becomes clear. So I'm going to try and do that this morning with you to give you the tools for when you do your own study. So the first thing I want to suggest to you is that names are never just names in the Bible and places are never just places. Okay, so we need to remember that. We've seen it over the last couple of weeks. You'll remember if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I spoke about the name David. And I talked about the significance of his name in Hebrew. Do you remember, it wasn't just the name David, but there was some significance attached to it. Or last week, I talked about that elderly couple. Do you remember? well advanced in years, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and I talked about their names. And I said how Zachariah's name meant God remembers, and Elizabeth's name meant the promise of God, and you put them together and it means the Lord remembers his promise. So names are never just names, there's something more to it, and places are never just places. So, where does this story take place? Well, in Luke chapter 2, we find that Mary and Joseph are in a place called, you've sung it, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. 
So when we read that, that's not just a name on a page. It should in our brains go, wait a minute. Are there any other places in the Bible that talk about Bethlehem? And maybe in our heads we're going, oh, we can remember the story of Ruth. Do you remember that story? And she's gleaning in the fields. Where were those fields? Around Bethlehem. Maybe it was the same field where those shepherds were. Interesting that it would have been in that vicinity. When we hear the name Bethlehem, we also think of a prophet called Micah who said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So names are never just names. And places are never just places. And I've said to you before, Bethlehem means house of bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. Let me give you another one. Where did Jesus grow up? Anybody? Nazareth. <clears throat> okay, and we may read that and say, oh, well, Jesus grew up in Nazareth and we move on in our Bible reading without re really realising. Now, the word Nazareth, the name in Hebrew is the word Nazareth. That's how it would have been pronounced. That word Nazar is really interesting because in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? Anyone know who he is? David's father. So a descendant is going to come from the line of David and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. That word branch is the word Nazar. So, Jesus grew up in Branch Village. It's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> How names are not just names and places are not just places. So Jesus was the bread of life. He was born in the house of bread and he grew up in Branch Village. Okay, so that's a, that's a really helpful thing. So next time you're reading and you come across a place or a name, check it out. Check it out. What's the meaning behind it? So, back to our story. We're going to be looking at these shepherds. And it says, in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> there were in the same country or the same vicinity around this place called Bethlehem, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. We all know it, right? Suddenly, the camera moves from this birth scene of Mary. She's given birth to her firstborn, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. And then the camera moves away, if you like, out into these fields and finds these shepherds washing their socks by night. Wait a minute, what, what did I say? Oh, no. Watching their flocks, that's right. And we hear shepherds in the field. You're reading this and you think back to all those nativity plays and you think back to these scruffy, poor shepherds. And you regularly hear sermons about the fact that these shepherds were the, the lowest of the low, the social outcasts who couldn't give a testimony in a court of law because they were untrustworthy and people rejected them. Have you ever heard a sermon based on that? That's often what people say. And often the message then that comes from the sermon is to say, well, look who God chose. He chose these rejects and these social outcasts to hear the message. I want to suggest to you that Part of that is true, that shepherds in Israel, out in, in kind of the wilderness, they take the sheep out and they were untrustworthy. They couldn't give testimony in a court. They were low down on the social scale. But I want to suggest to you something slightly different this morning in terms of who these particular shepherds were because of the significance of the place. They were around 
Bethlehem. And when you read into some of the writings of the sages and the, the rabbis and historians, they'll tell us that actually, yes, these were shepherds looking after their sheep, but they were also priests. They were shepherd priests. And that may come as a bit of a shock. How do we know this? Well, Bethlehem is five miles south of Jerusalem. And what did they do in Jerusalem, in the temple? Lots and lots of what? Sacrifices. Okay. And where do you think the lambs came from? You see, they raised the livestock. And they, guess where they got the lambs from for Passover? From Bethlehem. So these shepherds are not just shepherds in that they're looking after a flock of sheep, but they're actually priests who are looking after the, this flock. And what they would do was, they would have to check to make sure that these lambs were without defect. They were without blemish. And so what a first century hearer would hear was that Jesus was born in the same place where the Passover sacrificial lambs were born. I think that's really interesting. So a first century hearer would know that and they would suddenly hear that Jesus is born in Bethlehem and they would start to make a connection. The second thing that I want to say to you is, I don't know whether you've ever wondered about this idea where it mentions twice about swaddling clothes. Have you ever thought about that? The angel says that this will be a sign to you, you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, I don't know what comes to mind. I don't know whether you think of kind of how you would wrap a baby today. But if we go back into the first century and think about how they would do it, particularly these shepherd priests, they were responsible for making sure that the newborn lamb didn't bruise itself, didn't get any spot or blemish. So what they would do is they would wrap the lamb in special clothes. And do you know what that process was called? Swaddling. So when a Passover lamb was born in the fields around Bethlehem, to make sure that nothing happened to it, they would swaddle it. They would wrap it to stop it from bruising itself or breaking a limb. And so swaddling is what the shepherd priests did to mark a lamb as a sacrifice. So they would wrap this lamb and say, this one's ready to go. This one's ready to be used as a sacrifice. So Jesus was born where the Passover lambs were born and he was wrapped in the same way as the Passover lambs would be wrapped. And hopefully your kind of ears are tuned in a little bit now to what might have been going on. Does it help a little bit? We're maybe hearing a little bit more about what they would have thought and some of you are making links now with the passage and going, wait a minute, isn't Jesus our Passover lamb? It's very interesting, I think, and, I, and it brings a real interesting part to it that Jesus is being seen as the Passover lamb. So these shepherds are out in the field and suddenly an angel of the Lord appears to them and the glory of the Lord shines around them and they're filled with great fear. And I often think about this and think, here are these shepherd priests out in the field and suddenly an angel, do you notice it just says one, an angel came and said to them, fear not. And it's really, I find it really interesting, this, this whole idea of, uh, of an angel appearing and being scared, terrified. We looked at this last week, didn't we, about angels are majestic and powerful. But the angel says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. 
today in the town of David. And I want you to notice three things that the angel says about the baby. A saviour has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Three titles to this child. He will be the saviour, the Messiah and the Lord. And the angel announces that this saviour would be the special anointed one. Or one way to translate Messiah is the hero. I like that. The hero of the story. And then the angel offers a sign and says that you will find him in a feeding trough wrapped in swaddling cloths. In other words, he's going to be marked for the sacrifice. He's going to have the markings of the sacrifice. And what we find is the cross, the shadow of the cross is over the manger. The Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, born where the Passover lambs were born, wrapped as a Passover lamb. And we see the shadow of the cross. This hero, this child, this Jesus, this Messiah was born to die. And so we get this from Luke. Luke is making this clear to us. And then the angel says, glory to God in the highest. We've sung this, haven't we? And on earth, peace to men or women. You're not excluded from this. Humanity. And sometimes I think when we look at this passage and we can focus on things like peace and joy. But you know, when I read this, one of the things that I look at Glory to God in the highest heaven, is one translation, and on earth, peace. There is something going on between heaven and earth. And as I'm reflecting on it and I'm thinking, who is the one who can connect heaven and earth? This moment when this baby is born is when heaven touches earth. He is the one who can connect the two. How do you connect God in heaven who is holy with humanity on earth who are sinful? The only way is through a God-man. And the birth of Jesus is able to connect heaven and earth together that he will be the one who will restore peace between us and God. It's a beautiful thing that as we sing that, Maybe this Christmas we'll think about glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace. He is the one that connects the two together. And so, what do the shepherds do with their experience? They've had an undeniable experience. An angel has appeared. A multitude of angels have appeared. By the way, I don't know how many a multitude is, do you? But I know in the book of Revelation, it talks about a multitude and it talks about 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands. I mean, could you just imagine how many angels would have been there in the sky? So they've had this undeniable experience. And then it says, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. Okay, they hurried off, they made haste. This was the first Christmas rush, obviously. They came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. There are three things that the shepherds did. Okay, very quickly, I'll just go through them with you. Three things. Firstly, they believed. They believed what the angel had told them about the birth of a Messiah. They believed by faith that it had happened. Of course, if an angel shows up and then suddenly 
tens of thousands of angels show up and tell you something, if you don't believe it, you probably need your head read or something. You're going to believe it, aren't you? If You suddenly have this experience. But the first thing they did was they believed. The second thing is they went to check it out. They responded with obedience. And this is always the next step. After you hear a message about Jesus being the hero, and if you indeed believe it, the next step is to come to him. So they believed and then they came to see. The third thing they did, so, so they believed, they came. The third thing they did was they told. After finding Jesus, they went and told others. So they heard, they believed, they came, they saw, they went and they told. And by the way, that's exactly the same thing that happens after the resurrection. Thirty odd years later, Jesus dies. Remember, he's buried. He rises again. And the women come to the tomb. And the angel says, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Now go and tell his disciples. Do you see that? It's exactly the same. Come and see, go and tell. And that's the natural response, isn't it? Once we believe and once we've come to Jesus and we turn to him and there's a change in our life, we want to tell people about it, don't we? Do you remember when you got saved? Did you want to tell someone about it? I remember, eight years old, I got saved I was excited. And I remember arriving at my grandparents' house and I remember coming up the garden path and my grandparents were at the door and I said, hey, I've become a Christian. And they were like, oh, that's nice, dear. (laughs) I wanted to tell people. And then I got to school and I was out in the playground and I was telling my friends, if you don't repent, you're going to go to hell. Great way to make friends as an eight-year-old. Are we motivated to tell people the good news? Now, sadly, this desire to tell others tends to diminish over time, doesn't it? I mean, who is it that wants more than anything to tell people what happened to them? Who is it? It's new converts, right? It's it's people who've had an encounter with God and these shepherds had had an encounter with God and they wanted to tell everyone. And at the start, we can be full of that passion, can't we? But then, as we get a bit older, a bit more mature, a bit more crusty, we kind of lose the passion and the zeal a little bit, don't we? It's kind of like a slow puncture in a tyre. Kind of goes out. And the idea is we need to have that fresh encounter with God each and every day so that we will have that passion. You see, it's not enough just to hear about Jesus. It's not enough just to peek inside the manger It's not enough to say, oh, I like this time of year. I like the lights and chestnuts roasting on an open fire and frosty and, oh, it gives me a nice warm feeling. It's not enough just for that. We need to have an encounter with God to believe in him, to come to him today and every day and experience a change so that we can tell people about that change. There's an old legend, okay, so it's not a true story, okay, there's an old fable, okay, and it says that 40 years after the events that are taking place here, okay, the shepherds are all gathered together. They're old now, 40 years has passed, and they're all together and they're all talking, And the kids are there and the grandkids are there 
and they're all talking about the events of what happened that night 40 years earlier. And one of the grandchildren is listening and he interrupts his grandfather and he says, Grandfather, tell me more about that night. Is it true? Tell me about the baby that you saw. And his grandfather kind of ignores him and carries on the conversation. But his grandson wasn't going to stop there. So he interrupts him again and says, tell me, tell me about that baby. Is it true? His granddad hung his head and said to his grandson, I don't really know. I never went to see. Can you imagine being the one shepherd that didn't go to Bethlehem to check it out? Maybe there was such a shepherd. I mean, this is just a fable. Maybe they had to leave the sheep with someone. Maybe he said, yeah, you know what, you guys go, it's okay, I'll stay. And he never actually went. You know, sometimes I think we can be like that too. I've met people like that, who hear sermons about Jesus. They hear sermons about coming to him. They watch other people's lives be changed. They hear their stories, but they themselves never go. They don't come to Jesus themselves. And the story of the shepherds and the angels in that field around Bethlehem is a reminder that God sent a hero into this world. Good news of great joy for every single person. A saviour, a messiah, a hero. The God-man was born. And the shepherds responded in obedience. And they rushed to see the child and then had a passion to tell others. Do we have a passion to tell others the good news? Maybe it's kind of gone out like an air out of a tyre. Maybe we just don't do it. I pray that we would today come once again and have an encounter with Jesus that our lives would be changed, our lives would be transformed, and that we would be filled with a passion so that we would want to tell people about what's happened to us. We would want to tell people about Jesus. The shepherds came and they saw and they went and they told. And as we come once again to Christ, may we also go and tell the people we meet about the life-changing, life-transforming good news of great joy that the Messiah came to earth, the hero of the story, who lived and died and rose again so that our lives might be changed. The shepherds went about telling people the good news. And that's the call on our lives, isn't it? And so I wonder whether we might just take a moment to reflect on the challenge, if you like, this morning. That as we come and worship him, as we come and adore him, not just the baby in the manger, but the man that he would become, that he would die for us so that we could have a relationship with Jesus. We could be at peace with God and that we would tell other people. It's it's one of the great challenges, I think, for the church. How do we tell people? How is it to do with this passion that we want to talk about it? Those shepherds just wanted to tell people, didn't they? They wanted, that was the most important thing. Guess what? You know, sometimes I come across folk and they have some news to tell. Maybe it's 
you know, sometimes on Facebook and one of my friends as their newborn baby, they want to tell the good news. Maybe it's their, their child has walked for the first time or spoken for the first, maybe it's a grandchild that's done something special for the first time. You want to tell people, don't you? No? Yes? You do. When you have good news, you want to tell. And, the, and I guess the message for us today is are we motivated to tell the best news ever? Those shepherds were. They came, they saw, they went and they told. And so as we come to a, a close of our time together, my heart and my prayer is that once again we would come and worship the Christ. But not just to sing the words, but that there would be a change and that passion so that we would want to tell others. And so we're going to, in a moment, sing, I'm going to pray as we come and adore him, as we come and worship the baby in the manger. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, as we have reflected on the story of these shepherds, that they had an encounter with you. Father, I pray that for each one of us, we would have a fresh encounter with you in our lives. I pray that you would give us a passion and a desire. You'd give us an excitement and a joy that we would want to share the good news with our friends and our family, with our community, that we would share the good news of great joy that Jesus came to bring peace on earth. Father, I pray that we wouldn't just listen to other people's stories, but we would come ourselves and adore him, Christ the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Come by your Holy Spirit now. Encourage us and equip us over this period of time that we would share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen.